All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, the meeting, the annual meeting of the Minnesota Streetcar Museum is called to order. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing today, <clears throat> we'll run through a series of reports, starting with my report on uh, the year in review, and then the various officers uh, and uh, staff of the museum will go down and give reports. Um, at the end of my report, I'm going to talk about uh, how we're dealing with COVID-19 and uh, our plans for the year. Uh, once we get, we have a couple of items of business that the, the membership meeting, the annual meeting has to vote on. One will be approving the treasurer's report. Uh, another will be uh, the election of two new directors by acclamation because there is not a competitive election. So that will come a little bit later. Once the business portion of the annual meeting is done, um, we have a little bit of entertainment. Um, I've been working with a video editor for the last year, and I'm hoping that a lot of you have seen uh, the Como Harriet video, which is the first completed project that's now on YouTube. It's gotten about 2,800 views, and so I'm guessing a lot of our volunteers have seen it. The entertainment today is going to be more of the video that has been raw edited. This is not Como Harriet stuff. This is, uh, we have another, oh, about an hour and a half of stuff, and I thought I'd show about 20 minutes of it today, which goes line by line. Once again, it's a rough edit with no narration. I'll narrate over it. And then when that is done, uh, the annual meeting will adjourn, and the board of directors meeting will, uh, we'll have a short board of directors meeting. We have a couple of pieces of business to do there. We have to elect officers for the coming year, and we also have to um, elect, uh, appoint the class two appointed directors for one year terms. So anyway, uh, that's what's going to happen. Um, the year in review, Chris has uh, got control of the PowerPoint. If Chris, if you go to the first slide. So a series of projects were completed in uh, 2019. Some, as usual, some things take longer than we expect. We thought we had 1300 motors done and then one of the motors failed. Well, that motor has now been installed back in the car. The car is back on with four motors. Um, because of COVID-19, we had to abort uh, testing after a couple of days, but I was on the test crew and I can tell you that it's, it's perkier and it seemed to run pretty well. Um, so when, at some point we'll resume, and, uh, but it appears 1300s is probably in pretty good shape pending the completion of testing. Next slide, please. So the big project this year is the rebuilding of the trucks under streetcar 1239. We had a delay. We thought that was going to happen in 2019, uh, but unfortunately LNS uh, Motor, LNS Electric, which was the contractor to rebuild the motors, was delayed by a big order from Canadian Pacific that simply had a higher priority and the motors didn't get done in 2018. They are now getting done in 2019. That work has resumed. In addition to that, uh, our contractor, Rob Mangles, who is uh, overseeing the project, is working on it. As a matter of fact, it's moved up in his priority. Uh, Rob, as some of you may know, flies around the country doing contract specialty truck rebuilding. Well, he's not flying around the country these days, and so our project is at the top of his list. And even though we have restriction access to the car barn, Rob does have access with approval of the chief mechanical officer, and, and this work is continuing on. And so I'm hopeful that this will get done this year. Next slide. In the meantime, there's been a lot of work going on with the car 1239. Uh, Carl Jones has been the principal on this. Uh, one of the big items was rewiring the lighting inside. And in the course of it, Carl made a little history discovery. Uh, he said, I got up in the ceiling and there are additional places where there were fixtures. What were those fixtures? So I got out the photos and discovered that the gate cars, and we had backdated this to a gate car, had six additional light fixtures that we had not noticed before. And they were behind the front and side destination signs. Um, and the reason for those was you had to illuminate the signs at night and in the gate cars, as you can see from this picture, all the bulbs were along the walls. And so a Carl has installed uh, six new fixtures. So we are now more historically accurate. This also 
explain to us why when the cars were rebuilt for a one-man, two-man operation about 1930, like car 1300, uh, they went to a white ceiling and they went to center lights in the ceiling because they cut the number of light fixtures about in half. So this continues. The car, by the way, has been equipped with LED bulbs and uh, Carl has tested various LED bulbs to get the right color palette. Next. One of the other unexpected things that happened late last year was one of Winona 10's controllers uh, burned. And um, thanks to Howie Melko, who took the controller home, and here you see it opened up in his workshop, that controller has been rebuilt. Next. We never had enough proper uh, interior ad cards for Winona 10 or for car 265 in Duluth, or for that, I, I left off the slide, car 78. And so um, Bill Graham um, and I believe Rod, yeah, Bill Graham and Rod Eaton made a project out of creating car cards. And what they did is they went into the files of the newspapers from the eras that these cars ran and um, made copies of advertising text for our actual Winona and Duluth businesses. And then Rod went and found appropriate graphics. So now these are not intended to be replicas of actual ad signs. However, what they do do is communicate real advertising of the period within the cars. I thought it was a really neat project. Next. Uh, Fargo Moorhead Birney, number 28, had been sitting for years in Ken Albrecht's shed, and that space is no longer available. So it was necessary to get car 28 out. So a crew uh, overseen by Dick Zawacki and a whole bunch of volunteers from Excelsior um, hired Rocket Crane, got the car out, and brought it to the Excelsior car barn. The problem then was the car barn simply got too crowded to do the things that we needed to do in it and so it was necessary to find space elsewhere and the car is out in i want to say winstead or watertown one of those places somebody else can fill that in later um, and is now we've, we've rented some storage and basically it will have to stay there until such time as winona 10 can make the move to uh to lake harriet which would then open up space for this car next one of the projects that we did, uh, we had water infiltration in, uh, into the basement of the Como Harriet uh, Depot, and the steps and all were deteriorated. Uh, so we hired a, a company and they fixed it. Next. Out at Excelsior, as we experienced the Lake Harriet, we're getting uh, graffitied on the outside of the car barn. So it was necessary and unexpected expense, but necessary to go and put in anti-graffiti fencing like we've done along Como Harriet. Next. Uh, in the library, there have been several projects. Um, first, uh, we've, we've uh, cataloged all the 3D artifacts, things like the signs and uh, changers and badges and that sort of stuff. Um, Thanks to Ben Fransky and Jim Wilmore, we now have a book scanner. Um, whenever we resume activities in the car barn, we're going to start scanning documents, uh, beginning with some of the trans, uh, Twin City Rapid Transit uh, records. And also we want to get digital copies of Russ Olson's uh, work papers, which if you look at the shelf at upper right, you can see a whole bunch of the, on the top two and a half shelves. That's all of Russ's um, uh, notes and they're an invaluable resource and so we want to get them digitized uh, to make sure that uh, uh, that they'll survive. Uh, in addition to that, the Bill and Rose Aaron did a nice project recently uh, where they cleaned up the library and they we had a whole bunch of photos, illustrations, and other things that were kind of piled on file cabinets and they've hung them on the wall. So once again the library is looking better. Next. And in the history outreach area, uh, one of the things I did last year was to add over 600 photos to Minnesota Reflections, which is the online uh, library where you can access uh, photos, oh, over 150,000 photos from about 150 different museums and other institutions in Minnesota. And um, when you go onto our website to look for photos, that's where you wind up going. So now there's about, oh, 2,500 of them in there. Um, 
the 1950s Como Harriet uh, video went up a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's what I've been working on with uh, video editor Bill Alexi, professional video editor who's donated his time. And uh, that is taking the two hours plus of vintage video and putting it into programs. Uh, the first step on that was simply, it took us about 40 hours of work just to go and sort it out geographically because it jumped all over the place. So that video is up. The video that I'm gonna show you is partially edited, uh, a raw video uh, from this project. And whenever Bill and I can get back together after the virus, we're going to create more programs. Uh, the other thing that's been happening, and this is thanks to Brian Long and Rod Eaton, um, is that we are putting up regular uh, history posts on YouTube, and Rod will talk later about how we're increasing our Facebook presence. Next. Oh, <laughs> that's the slide for Facebook. So next. So uh, it's always, as Yogi Berra said, uh, making predictions is always difficult, especially about the future and uh, especially this year, here are things that we hope will happen uh, depending on uh, when we can get back into our car barns and, and do things. Uh, we're hoping to have a Winona 10's motor repaired and a new controller installed on the other end of the car. We're hoping that 1239's trucks will be completed. And also in addition to uh, the various cosmetic work that we can get the Baker heater replica uh, that we purchased for that car last year installed. We thought last year the speed of the new speeder would be done. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Uh, hopefully by the end of this year it'll be done. When that happens, the plan is for the old electric speeder to go to Excelsior and for the gas speeder at Excelsior to be sold. Um, I, I have been hoping now for a couple of years to have solar power for streetcars. Our member Ross Hammond, who's an energy consultant, has been trying to get us signed up for solar farm power. And the problem has been that the solar farms aren't getting done as fast as they were supposed to. But I'm hoping by the end of the year, this will happen. And what this means is we're, we'll be buying power from solar farms, which will actually save us a few hundred bucks a year. And then we can boast that our streetcars are solar powered. Uh, streetcar internal wiring uh, is uh, hopefully be completed. I, I'm not up to speed on the details, so I'll be looking to Dick Zawacki or somebody to give details on that. The other big project that we're going ahead with this year is the overhead wire rehab at Como Harriet and at ESL. Uh, we have $55,000 that is specifically restricted and donated for that purpose. Um, I think that project will probably be, get bigger and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the clean out and uh, cosmetic restoration of Masabi 10, of course, is in its early stages, but that work will continue when we can get back in the car barn. Another project that we're hoping, uh, Dennis Stevens and others have been working on building the new tower car at Lake Harriet. And finally, uh, our joint project with the Linda Hills Neighborhood Council to put uh, a dozen uh, his history signs of the kinds that are along the Como Harriet line along the 44th Street streetcar right-of-way. Um, hopefully we'll get done here this summer. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, I wanted to talk about COVID-19 and uh, what's going to happen. Um, first, you should know the Board of Directors, uh, if you don't already know, has canceled the uh, operations for uh, the month of May. Now we haven't looked beyond May because of course we want to wait and see what's going to happen. I personally think there's a very good chance that those will be canceled as well. Um, but here's the deal that I want the members and the board to, uh, to understand. And that is we are not like a lot of small businesses where, where we are caught in between uh, risking our health versus going bankrupt. We don't have that problem. And the purpose of this slide is to show you that we are in good shape financially. Even though we would take in a net of something like $80,000 of new revenue this year, if we operated for the entire year, we don't have to be open this year. Uh, and even though we will lose that revenue, we currently, if you can look at this uh, exhibit, we currently have $392,000 cash on hand. My estimate, for what it would take to keep the lights on this year, even if we don't operate, but 
we do uh, shop maintenance type projects uh, is $40,000, which would leave us 352,000 at the end of the year available for capital projects. Um, by my estimation, we have $112,000 remaining of work to perform on car 1239. We've got the money for that. We've got the $28,000 for Winona 10's motor. We've got the money for that. We've got the $55,000 for the overhead wire project. We have the money for that. And Ben Fransky has $5,000 in miscellaneous technological upgrades that we definitely have the money for. And what that does is that drops us down to 152,000. Now, we have a longstanding uh, board approved policy that we don't want our cash to go below 100,000. And I think that's wise because technically, if you, if you can imagine the, the worst scenario that we didn't run this year and that for some reason we didn't run next year, we could still survive two years of not running at all. Can you go to the last slide, please, Chris? Now we have options if we wanted to take it down to $100,000 this year. We could overhaul 1239's other two motors, which is a little bit more than that. Uh, Dick Zawacki, the chief mechanical officer, has said that that is not necessary at this time, that we can run 1239 with two motors as we have run car 1300. And so that, that work can be delayed if we want to. Another thing that we have the option of delaying, we are proposing to pave the rest of the Excelsior car barn floor this year and also realign tracks two and three, because right now you can't take a wide car in and out of tracks two and three um, because of some miscalculations when the place was built. We also think that that's also something that is not necessarily pressing uh, and can be deferred this year. And so we're now we're going to defer it. Um, my personal feeling on the overhead wire project, once we get into it, is that it's probably gonna cost more than $55,000. And my personal feeling, this has not been approved by the board, and we're not gonna take action on this immediately until later this year. But my personal feeling is that we should reserve the $52,000 if we need to expand the overhead wire project once we get into it. So once again, I cannot make this as a unilateral decision. That will be a board decision, but this is kind of the state of where we're at right now financially. So anyway, uh, that concludes my report. Chris, I guess we can open it up for questions, right? That's right. Okay, um, if anyone has a question, uh, I, I suppose, Chris, do you just unmute people, unmute everybody for a moment? Um, I think people can unmute themselves if they have any questions. Okay. In that case, then, uh, go ahead. Please identify yourself because I don't necessarily have your picture up on the screen. This is Pat. So if we're not going to be operating, wouldn't now be the best time to do the overhead wire project as much as we can? No uh, in, in fact, Pat, we had originally planned to do it after Labor Day with the idea that then we would be down to weekend operations, the, cons the contractor could work during the week, put it back together, we could run weekends. Uh, anticipating exactly what you, uh, the issue that you raised, that we might not be running this summer, I've asked Chief Engineer Keith Anderson um, to uh, try to figure out if we could do that. Now, he's currently going through, he's selling his house and going through a move, which is what is delaying that. Um, one of the things that we have to do in order to do this project is to get overhead wire materials from a uh, Halton County uh, Railway Museum, Trolley Museum out in Toronto. And Jim Vicunas is our contact with that. Uh, uh, Jim, Keith is going to contact you and, and ask you to see if, if uh, the acquisition of those materials can be expedited. And so the question will be, can we get materials in and then can we go through a bidding process and hire a contractor before Labor Day? I'm guessing the answer is yes, and we're gonna to try to do it. Jim, any, uh, um, anything to add? Well, I haven't contacted Halton, uh, Halton County in quite a while. Uh, as you may recall, we had other streetcar parts that we were interested in that they were willing to part with, but I'm just gonna to have to contact them and and see if they're alive and well and whether they're ready to do business or not. Uh, uh, dealing with them is kind of interesting. So I'll leave it at that. But, uh, uh, you know, this is not a priority for them, but certainly it's a priority for us. So let's see what we can do to, to chit chat with them and maybe uh, put a fire underneath them to 
make a decision. Yeah, uh, Jim, I would say even uh, though Keith hasn't formally contacted you, if you could go ahead and make that contact, that would be a good thing. Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay, hearing none, I guess uh, we will move on to um, the reports by museum officers. The first is the secretary's report from Jim Vicunas. Well, good morning all. Uh, I'm pleased to report that as of this moment, there are 65 people online, which is, which is terrific. So uh, with that, uh, next slide, please, Chris. Okay, just uh, as corporate secretary, there's certain things I have to monitor. Uh, uh, one of which is just compliance with all the federal, state and local regulatory regulatory reporting requirements and we have met all those so it's not a lot but uh, and it's not that difficult but we have done that uh, the the basic one is uh, the treasurer's uh, report to the state attorney general so uh, and that was done in a very timely manner I uh, believe it or not our insurance for this year increased by the grand total of 250 bucks uh, all of the primary, the liability, the property coverage uh, remained actually the same for this year. Uh, the only change was on the directors and officers uh, insurance. That went, that got bumped up by a couple of hundred bucks. So that was pretty good news. Next slide. Okay, membership is pretty stable. Uh, you can read the numbers. I don't have to repeat them. Of course, I am uh, concerned specifically about this year uh, with, the, with the virus and people's focus on other higher priority things. I've got my fingers crossed that they will continue the support to the, the museum by renewing their, their memberships. Uh, a couple of people have already said they couldn't do it. Uh, and that's that's obviously okay, um, but I'm hoping that that 300 to 320 number that we have been fluctuating uh, 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 back and bouncing forth for the last five, six years uh, uh, holds steady. Uh, next slide. And finally, on the governance, I am responsible for just overseeing the, all the governance things we need to do and uh, uh, you can read the the bullets there we will have our elections this morning for Karen and Chris Heck the board meetings we've had three and remember you, you can you can always go to the website to see what was discussed and the decisions made it's right there in the organizational documents section so if you're interested you can find that information to include the reports from uh, like Chris Hack and Bruce Gustafson and Todd Bender on their respective uh, areas of uh, operations and, and control uh, in the last issue of the streetcar currents I made a comment that it would be helpful to people to have people start renewing online and I am pleased to report that uh, people read that and they come and they decided to do it that way. And we've had probably 20, 20 to 30 people who have uh, renewed online as opposed to sending in uh, their dues, you know, via the USPS. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, COVID-19 impact and membership, I suspect this year it's going to be down. And the only reason why I say that is our uh, prospective operators usually joined in March and April uh, of each year. And because we did not, we have canceled training for this year, I'm afraid that probably 15 to 20 people will not join. They'll, they'll wait till next year. And that's unfortunate, but it's just the reality. And I think that's my last slide, Chris. Uh, Jim, uh, please tell them about your plans for the currents this year? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, we had a, a short discussion in, uh, uh, I don't know, last week or so. 
and uh, we will continue to uh, to publish the currents. Uh, and of course, it won't be a lot of, of current information because we're going to be kind of in hibernation except for the, the, the folks that are working in the shop. So I'm hoping that those folks will uh, take some photos and I'll be down there. Once they open up, I'll be down to take photos to report on progress on the, the various projects that Aaron mentioned. Uh, plus, we're going to probably have maybe just a tad more short little history Histor historical vignettes. Uh, a couple of interesting little things came up uh, just over the last two, three weeks that are uh, uh, could have gone into the History Magazine, the Twin City Lines, but maybe we'll put them uh, with the help of Aaron and, and maybe a couple of others, put them into the, the current. So uh, uh, look forward to having the currents come out, uh, you know, during the course of the year as it normally did you know, May to October. Hopefully it'll come out monthly. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, uh, any questions from uh, any of the members on any of my stuff? Uh, Jim, this is Rod. Hey, Rod. If we don't operate much this summer or not at all this summer, would we get a, a rebate or a refund on our liability insurance? Uh, you know, I asked our, uh, our uh, insurance brokers out in California that exact question like two days ago. And their response was, uh, uh, no. Well, no, I didn't ask them. But no, what you I asked did them was, about something different. Yeah, I asked them about whether we could uh, put a claim in for lost income. And the answer to that was, no, there was a spe specific clause in the policy that said anything to do with viruses or bacterial diseases, they don't file, they, they don't uh, uh, do any claims. The, the thing with the, with the uh, liability is we're still going to have members on, on and about the property probably uh, uh, starting in, I don't know, maybe, maybe in May, who knows. Uh, but it only amounts to 1052 bucks. So I, my, my, my attitude is why bother for that amount of money? Plus, if in fact we do operate starting in July, August, whenever, we're going to need it. So my, my recommendation is, you know, don't worry about it. Jim? Yo. Phil, Phil Epstein here. Hello, Phil. I'd like to take us back to the membership. And I would like you to consider setting up a fund with contributions from us for those who are reluctantly giving up their membership due to financial hardships to cover those who would like to stay as members but can't afford it for one reason or another. A fund well, set up from donations by us. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'll probably leave that to Barb Gaycheck since she is our membership service director manager. Uh, I suspect, and I don't know this, uh, but I suspect that uh, a lot of the people who perhaps won't uh, be renewing or haven't renewed probably wouldn't have renewed in any event. But I'm going to leave it up to uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, Pat Cosgrove or Barb to do some follow-up with those people. Uh, I like your idea. And that might be something the board should consider if it's a financial hardship situation. But I suspect it's uh, probably not that. But that's a good idea. I like it. Yeah, Jim, let Barb and I know who those people are. And we can, well, Barb and I can chat and then we can follow up. Yeah, and Barb, well, Barb will be able to tell you, you know, on a month to month basis who did not renew. We usually give folks two months to renew and they get the. Uh, they get a renewal notice, they get a second notice, and uh, you know, maybe two, three weeks after that second notice is when they would uh, be uh, ripe for giving a call and finding out you know, what was the reason. Uh, we've had a couple that I've already indicated, and it was more a matter of meh, I just don't want to renew. Huh, okay. Yeah, Jim, can you hear me? Steve Simon I, speaking? I yeah, can't. Steve. Uh, Jim, as you know, I, I broke my arm last May, and my health insurance covered everything but the court days and okay. on the track. And getting the reimbursement for my co-pays from the 
Trolley's insurance company was incredibly complicated, painful. They kept saying documentation is not sufficient. Um, I must have spent hours and hours to get a small, a couple of hundred dollars worth of copay. Um, it, it, we shouldn't have to go through that. Uh, for and there was no question of the claim. I broke my arm. Oh, I I know it. I, I remember they, the they, all that. Stuff. They were nitpicking documentation that I sent them, and finally I gave up. I got maybe uh, three quarters of, of all my copays, but I just gave up. And I, I wonder if you could take a look at uh, a talk to the insurance company to find out somebody who's injured should not have to go through that. Yeah, I I talked to our uh, when. When uh, you and I, uh, you know, uh, communicated back when you when you broke your arm and and had this problem, I talked with our guys out in uh, California. I didn't talk directly with the people in Maine who handled your claim, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I will I will talk with them again. I don't know whether this accident insurance is available through somebody else, but I'll uh, I'll check that out too. Because, like Luckily, you say, most of my healthcare costs were covered by my own insurance policy. But if, if somebody was injured and didn't have good coverage, they would have had a long time before they were able to get their bills paid. Oh, anyway. I know. And, and, and as you well know, that's what they try to do to discourage people from f filing a claim and following up. So, so I appreciate your stick to itiveness. Okay. Um, I think that'll probably it for Jim. Uh, the next item is the treasurer's report. Chris? All right, so good morning everyone. We can skip past this slide. Um, this is a quick overview of year-end cash balances uh, for the past few years. Um, 2019 came in above our budgeted value since we tend to budget quite conservatively. Uh, 2020 ha should really have two asterisks by it because the 220,000 projected uh, year-end cash balance uh, comes from our original 2020 um, budget, which really has not been adjusted yet uh, due to any COVID-19 influences. I will talk more about that later on. Um, but uh, suffice to say, the museum is doing well financially, and as Aaron mentioned earlier, um, we're in a lot better shape than other organizations. So in uh, 2019, these were the budgeted capital expenses, capital expenses being anything major, anything outside of operating expenses. Um, motor repair to cars 10 and 1300 was about 24,000. Tower car was budgeted at 10, I think came in a little bit above that. Uh, the Baker heater for 12.39 that Aaron talked about earlier, uh, 8,500, I think we were a little bit above that. Uh, electrical upgrades to 12.39, 1,300 was budgeted just over 1,000, and the 12.39 truck rebuild was budgeted at 1,400. Um, this really should also have an asterisk behind it. This is the budget that was approved by the board, which may be revised once we know more um, about the potential impact of COVID-19 in 2020. Uh, but provisionally we've discussed and approved uh, spending 13, or excuse me, 24,000 for car 1300 motor rebuild, um, 120,000 for 1239, um, number 10 out at Excelsior, uh, 27,000, overhead rehab as Aaron talked about earlier, 50,000, which will probably grow from there. And the car barn rail realignment, which as Aaron also mentioned, will probably be curtailed. Um, was 7,000. This is uh, some information on the operational income history by category. Um, again, 2020 is the budgeted amount that, that may be revised, but you can see that uh, donations and fairs and special events comprise the vast majority of uh, the museum's operational income. Um, that does not uh, include some, some smaller things and there, there's others that are consolidated into other, but you can see that those proportions um, are, are relatively consistent year to year. And um, 2019 was a bit down from 2018 as I'm sure Bruce Gustafson will talk about due to bad weather and other things. And uh, for 2020, uh, we're anticipating uh, a hit as well due to COVID-19. By the way, Chris, uh, can you go back to the last slide? Uh, in 2016 and 17, 
uh, what you're looking at there was uh, the very large grants that we got for, um, let's see, uh, oh, for Car Barn. I think a combination of Car Barn and uh, Car 1300. Uh, those are sort of one-time things, so that's not something we should expect every year. Okay. All right. So um, this is basically the same chart broken out in a different fashion. So rather than uh, each bar representing a category and each uh, sort of chunk of bars representing a year, uh, this is the exact opposite. Each chunk of bars represents a category and each individual bar represents a year. So you can see what Aaron was just talking about um, in uh, 16 and 17 that we got a lot of donations that varied quite a bit from average. But um, this kind of tells you that from year to year, there isn't a, a, a huge swing in any of these categories. All right, operational expenses. It, it'll be the same two charts here. First of all, categorized by year, and then second of all, broken out by category. But you can see um, in 2019, we did have uh, a few more uh, expenses due to unforeseen circumstances, which basically it was uh, car related projects. For 2020, we're expecting a dip in that, but again, this will probably be adjusted down further, um, whether by choice or by the fact that we're not running um, due to COVID-19. And again, showing you that these categories are, are relatively consistent year to year. All right, um, this one is a little bit difficult to read, but I couldn't think of a better way to display it. So this shows for each year, the first two columns on the left, blue and green show income versus expenses at Como Harriet, and then yellow versus red show income versus expense at uh, Excelsior. Uh, I will say that for 2020, uh, we revised the chart of accounts and revised some of our bookkeeping techniques um, that will adjust some of these a little bit. So that, that's why you see such a dramatic flip between income and expenses at Excelsior from years prior. But uh, under our old uh, accounting system, um, we had a, a difficult time breaking even or, or, or making a profit at, at Excelsior, whereas Como Harriet uh, year to year uh, made a very consistent profit. So um, like you see many companies out there trying to forecast the unknown forecast uh, COVID-19, Aaron and I had sort of different takes on this. Aaron's uh, take was that we would have no income at all. Um, this is a, a different take on it that says maybe we would have some uh, income towards the fall of the year, assumes basically almost no regular operations for the summer, but perhaps some of our uh, higher profiting fall events would still be able to occur. We obviously would have the same starting balance for the year, a much lower revenue for the reasons I just mentioned. Um, we would have somewhat lower operating expenses, though a lot of them um, still remain. Uh, we can we can cut down on the merchandise we buy. We have this lower power bill because we're not running, but as Jim mentioned, the insurance, um, the power for the car barns and things like that still, still maintains the same. So uh, we, we would lose a little bit of money there, but uh, suffice to say, even if we reduced or uh, kept relatively the same capital projects, we'd still end up with a very uh, healthy end balance for the end of the year. And uh, as, as Aaron mentioned, our, our sort of infernal policy has always to been to keep above 100,000. And even if we get some operations or no operations in, in 2020, um, there will still be uh, money left in the bank uh, by the time this is all said and done. I think that is my last slide. So um, before I open up to questions, I would also just like to thank um, Tim Crane, who was at the museum's uh, uh, bookkeeper uh, up until December 31st of 2019. And all of these numbers and all these figures would not be possible without all the hard work that Tim did. So Tim, thank you very much. Uh, and also another thank you to Mona Isaacs, who took over as bookkeeper as of the first of the year. Uh, and uh, the, the budgeting amounts and, and all that would not be possible without the hard work she does and continues to do so. Thank you to Mona as well. So with that, um, any questions about the museum's finances? Hey, I, I don't, go ahead. I have a question that is, uh, uh, because I'm a, I'm a relative newcomer, uh, what happened in the year uh, 2015? That we had a higher income, Ted? Well, they, 
I thought the results looked bad in 2015. Um, I don't remember, to be honest. This was before my time as treasurer. Um, I think it's, it's inflated a little bit uh, because 20... Uh, Oops. I'm not getting you. I think we lost Chris and he's the... Oops, are you there? Yeah, I'm Maybe. here. I think okay. we lost Chris for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what happened. You glitched. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess I'll repeat what I just said. Um, I, the, Ted, this was before my time as treasurer, so I don't recall. I think it's it's a bit not necessarily misleading, but it looks worse than it is because 26 and 2017 were uh, years with extraordinary donations. Um, but Keith, Aaron, do you? See, I, uh, can you show an expense chart for 20, uh, 2015? Sure. I just no. wondered if if, no. if there was a hurricane that I missed or something. That no, I mean, we were coming off the Como Harriet Carbarn expansion. We had spent a lot of money. We spent $250,000 on that. So there might be some abnormalities there. But no, I, uh, okay. Ted, I don't think there's anything out of the ordinary. OK, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Chris? I move to accept the treasurer's uh, report as presented. Daryl. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Did, uh, uh, before Pat makes his motion, was there somebody else with a question? Yes, I have a question. Darryl, Aaron? Yeah, Dennis, go ahead. Um, would it be useful in future years to break out uh, grant money from other donations? Uh, well, we certainly keep a separate record of it. Uh, I don't, you know, we had a whole discussion as to how detailed the general ledger uh, should be. And we kind of said, hey, a donation is a donation, but I keep a separate record of all the grants. So uh, we've got that information. Um, I see Daryl Arndt. Did you have a question, Daryl? Yes, I did. In respect to the, uh, I'm not suggesting one way or the other, but at the, uh, toward the end of the year, uh, if you do limited operations, your expenses are going to exceed your revenue. Uh, is there a point where it would be best not to operate to save that deficit, uh, eliminate that deficit, uh, or maybe there's a PR aspect plus the uh, benefit of members at least getting to do some operating? I no, uh, Daryl, I can tell you that when we operate, we turn a huge profit, <laughs> and so even though we're a nonprofit. And so, no, there is, uh, there is no downside um, to doing any kind of limited operation. Uh, we always, it, it's always a moneymaker. Oh, I misinterpreted the, uh, the chart there, I guess. I think that the reality of it, Daryl, is that if, if we don't operate in the fall, we will lose money. If we do operate in the fall, we will probably still lose money. We'll just lose less money. And the reality of it is that the, the incremental cost of operating for a little bit in the fall is easily made up by uh, the income we will take in from those rides. The, the expenses that we incur are sort of all of the other things that still happen regardless of whether we're, we're operating or not. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it, Chris, and, and one comment I'd like to make is, uh, uh, and I don't know how it's proportioned out uh, over the last couple of years, but for the dozen to 15 days that we operated for Halloween and the Santa Claus streetcar rides, that, that comprised about 30% of our gross income. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we can start operating, for example, in September or October, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be doing pretty well with the proviso that we're going to have to be careful about uh, social distancing and the wearing of the masks and all that, you know. Yeah, so well, that's going to obviously have, have a part to play in, in operating for at least in this year. Yeah, and by the way, I don't want to get yet into a discussion of social distancing or how we would do it just because that'll tie us up. Do oh yeah, I know. Anything, do we have anything else for the treasurer? 
Um, I'm not sure when Dennis Stevens asked this, but he asked a question in chat and I can answer it now. Dennis asked, is our intent to reuse the overhead conductor or that is to not replace significant portions at Como area? Dennis, yes. Uh, I think uh, from from uh, our discussion so far is that there, there shouldn't be a need to replace much, if any, of the overhead conductor, that the work taking place will largely be to tighten the slack in the line, to realign uh, the placement of the overhead over the, the center of the track or, or tangentially as necessary, and lastly, to replace uh, any rotten poles. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, I think now we're probably ready for the motion. Uh, the membership has to vote to approve the treasurer's report. And Pat, you have the motion. Yes, I uh, move to approve the treasurer's report as presented. Jack, I just one last question before we go to the vote, and that is, uh, what's to be done about uh, uh, maintaining the uh, track and right away? Uh, uh, there's a lot of rotten uh, ties out there that ought to be replaced, and I heard nothing about uh, uh, maintenance of uh, way. Okay, I can respond to that. Thanks, Russ. Uh, <clears throat> we're by, by my eyeballing, we currently have about 15% bad ties at Como Harriet. Um, if you go in and look at the Federal Railroad Administration's uh, standards for class, uh, we, we operate on something between class one and class two track because uh, class one track uh, is 15 miles an hour. We exceed that a little bit. Um, our track is far, far better than what FRA minimum for class two is. And plus our axle loadings are only half as much as for a freight railroad. And for that, for that reason, we're not in any immediate danger, even though as you walk along, you see bad ties. Now that said, uh, after we get the overhead wire done and 1239 done, our next big capital project will be a track renewal project. And the question is when we will have enough money to do that. I've, I foresee that probably about two years out. But, but what I can tell you is we're, we're, we're safe to operate and then some. Okay, we've had the motion, we've had the second to approve the treasurer's report. Uh, Chris, I guess we probably need to turn everybody off, everyone's mute off so we can have a voice vote. How does that sound? <coughs> Chris is, okay, so um, all, those, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those the motion passes. Very good. I guess we can mute people again. Okay. Uh, before we do that. Good. Yeah. Sorry, I, the, the, <laughs> there, there's no easy way to do it. So I muted everyone and Jim and Aaron, you can unmute as necessary now. Okay. Yeah, who seconded that motion? Stanley Castle. Okay, Stanley, thank you. Okay. All right. Next up is the General Superintendent's Report. Bruce Gustafson, are you with us? I am here, Aaron. Uh, thank you and, and uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to everybody today. So uh, 2019, uh, very similar to the, the past couple of years uh, in, in most respects. What makes you, oh, Chris, I'm sorry, can you go to the next slide? Sorry about that. So what, what makes 2019 really kind of exceptional, as is stated there in the, the first bullet, is the museum handled its, its two millionth guest in 2019. Again, that's since the, the start of the museum back in the, in the 70s. For a uh, number of operators, we, we had uh, 124 members on the, uh, volunteers on the, the roster, 108 active. That breaks down to 84 at, at Como Harriet, 30 at Excelsior. If you do the math, that implies that there are six that are uh, operated at uh, both locations. Those numbers are very comparable to the last uh, three years. The number of operating hours, again, for, for Como Harriet and for Excelsior, comparable to 2018. What we see, have seen, again, over the last several years is a, a concentration of uh, of a relatively small number of volunteers providing a, a disproportionate number of hours. You can see there at Como Harriet, there's 15 operators provided almost about half the hours, and at Excelsior, six operators provided 52% of, of the hours. 
At the bottom uh, training, as uh, most of you know, 2019, we had a smaller graduating class than we've had the last couple of years, uh, nine last year versus sort of the 16 to 18, which we had seen in the last couple of years prior to that, six at Excel, or six at Como Harry at three at Excelsior. The operator, the new hire operators are listed there in the bottom right hand corner. They supplied 6% of the hours, which given the size of the class is, is comparable again to prior years. Next page, Chris. So this is a picture of, of the performance, the 2019 performance at, at Como Harriet. Um, we serve just under 27,000 riders. It's a, as, as noted there in the first bullet, it's a 6% decline over the prior year. We've seen over the last four years kind of a steady decline. Uh, the, the rate of decline really is dependent upon what, um, the, the, to some degree, the weather and what, candidly, more importantly, what day the weather hits. In 2019, two, two, we had two kind of dramatic events on weather days. Um, as you can see in the table there, Memorial Day was a washout. We had 16 riders. Typical Memorial Day will have uh, several hundred, uh, four to 500 riders. The other day we lost in 20, um, 2019 at Como Harriet, we lost one of the four Holly Trolley days. The Holly Trolley again serves about four to 450 per day. And so the combination of Memorial Day and the Holly Trolley loss literally would, would, would have, uh, if we had normal riderships on those two days, we would have done better than we did in 2018. Just as a note, you know, kind of conversation prior to this, um, to sort of allude to or support the impact of the uh, holiday events, the four, the, the four holly trolley events plus Vinternaut uh, on a normal season earns the museum somewhere north of $10,000. So just in those two weekend days, that's uh, a substantial amount of money. The, the balance of the special events continued to be uh, incredibly strong. The numbers there in the table, uh, you, you can kind of read those and, uh, on your own, are, are comparable to prior years. Again, literally Memorial Day is sort of the difference between uh, 2018 and 2019. Um, that's all I have for, for Como Harriet. I'm gonna turn it over to Todd to talk about Excelsior and then I'll come back and finish up with uh, our plans for 2020. Todd? Uh, can you hear me? We yep. Can. Go ahead, Todd. Okay. Actually, I do not have uh, anything really prepared to talk about Excelsior. Uh, for brevity, I was just going to defer it all over to um, Bruce or ask if there's any comments. Um, I can do a quick chat just based on our ridership and stuff like that. It's We didn't have record ridership in 2019, but it was steady compared to 2018 as well. Um, a lot of talks have been made about the special events, and again, uh, those are the big revenue generators out at Excelsior. Uh, we did take a hit also on Memorial Day, and we also took a ridership hit on crazy days in Excelsior due to uh, unusually hot weather. But um, I don't want to ramble on too much here because, again, I don't have anything actually prepared. Are there any questions or anything regarding Excelsior? And Todd, I apologize for putting you on the, the, the spot. I, I, I think you did a nice job. Um, Excelsior, much like Como Harriet, was, was a, a pretty normal year with, as Todd and I both mentioned, some sort of unfortunate timing of, of weather events. Let, let's move on to the, the next slide, Chris, and, and then we'll open up for questions at the end. So COVID-19, uh, again, this is just sort of a recap from some of the comments that uh, both Aaron and Jim had mentioned earlier on. Uh, at this point, uh, is, as Aaron alluded to in the beginning, the May operating schedule has been suspended. Uh, car maintenance, car barns and maintenance work, uh, Dick Zawacki, who, who will follow me after this, uh, has closed the uh, car barns at least through May 4th, and I'm assuming that there will be some new communication as to whether or not that'll be extended. As Aaron also alluded to, uh, we have canceled the 2020 training for, right, actually it was Jim did that, uh, canceled the training for uh, new operators this year. Um, I have sent out and I've received uh, approximately 60, 65 of the recertification quizzes. 
Um, we are moving forward, assuming we will open up at some point, getting the recertification quizzes completed will allow us, once there's a decision made to, to actually operate, will allow us to, to sort of uh, get up to speed uh, much quicker than if we have to do the quizzes at that time. Uh, next slide, Chris. So we, we had prior to back in, uh, I guess it was January, the operating operations committee got together and we did make some changes or modifications to the schedule. Um, we have eliminated uh, Monday evening service. Uh, for most of you, I think you're aware that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all are, are relatively weak uh, performing uh, schedules. We eliminated that to twofold. One, uh, Chris and others had asked for some time, non-weekend time to do, uh, potentially to do some sort of maintenance work and it would also give some options for uh, training should we need to do that. In its place, we've added a Friday afternoon service uh, for the summer months. Uh, this is a follow-up to what is a very successful Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon service. So we, we've expanded our, our daily service just in a different spot. And then we ex have extended, as it says there, we've extended uh, regular service through the third weekend in October. At uh, Excelsior, Excelsior uh, has added uh, Friday operations, uh, the Memorial Day, or MEA weekend, I apologize. And then the, there's been some changes in the farmer market operations. And so the, the schedule will be consistent with the new uh, schedule for the farmers, uh, farmer market operations. So with that, that's the, sort of the full gamut of both 19 and 20. At this point, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I'd like to add uh, just something more to what I said about COVID-19. And that, of course, our highest priority is the safety of both our volunteers and our customers. And because we're not under financial pressure uh, to reopen, um, I think we're going to probably be pretty conservative about it. Um, I think, I don't think we're going to be out there ahead of other people in trying to get running early. Now, having said that, um, I, I will put together a little group within uh, and probably working with Bruce Gustafson to say if we, uh, when we open, under what sort of special circumstances will we open, you know, because we know that, uh, that um, distancing and masks and all various things like that will probably be part of the deal even when we do reopen. But I just wanted to uh, uh, insist that, uh, you know, there's not a hurry to do that. The other thing is that I think might happen sooner will be the opening of the shops and that'll be a decision made by the general superintendent and the chief mechanical officer. So anyway, now do we have any questions for Bruce? I see that Dennis Stevens has, has asked a question on chat about opera, uh, reporting on the non-operator hours. And Dennis, I think that's a great point. I, I think one of the, I, I, I'm more than happy to report on that. I just have to find a kind of a consistent, reliable source of that information. So if that's something that, that, that we can get out of the log books, I'll, I'll uh, make an effort to do that going forward. Do we have other questions for Bruce? Uh, this is Chuck Anding. I'm not sure if this is for Bruce, but it just got started thinking about um, if we do go back into operation with this COVID-19 out there, have we given any consideration to getting any of the disinfect disinfecting equipment, those sprayers or, or anything like that? Well, once again, I think it's premature to get into the details. Suffice it to say that we will not reopen until every possible detail and everyone is satisfied. The other thing is that uh, if we do reopen, of course, it will be voluntary because we're not going to ask any volunteer to do something that they feel would endanger themselves. So, uh, you know, you make a good point. I think that'll be part of whatever package uh, of policies uh, and procedures that we adopt. Uh, this is Leah Harp. Um, I just wanted to point out in the last uh, report uh, with the training class from 2019, of which I was a part, there were two female participants, two graduates, and I think that's wonderful to increase the numbers, and I look forward to supporting more outreach to um, diversify our volunteer base. Thank you, Leah. Is there anybody else? 
Okay, if not, we're going to move down to the, mechanic, uh, the mechanical department report. Uh, Dick Sawacki. Uh, yes, this is Dick. Um, Hi, Dick, go ahead. Uh, Chris, could I have the next slide, please? Um, I think you just went backwards. Oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. Sorry, you didn't. Um, yeah, as uh, mentioned before, uh, we have uh, ceased all uh, maintenance activities at least through uh, May 4th. Um, uh, we have uh, allowed a few people back in the car barns uh, on, uh, an, on an as-needed basis. Um, I guess uh, in, uh, in addition to that, uh, we just have uh, found out that uh, uh, the Minnesota Transportation Museum is going to be opening their um, their car barns for maintenance, and uh, we will probably follow a lot of their uh, guidance as far as uh, how we uh, open once once we do decide to open. Uh, but as of this time, at this point, uh, we haven't made any specific um, decisions or or uh, set any dates on when that will happen. But uh, just to reinforce what Aaron had said, uh, uh, certainly we're going to respect everyone's uh, decisions on coming back and, and uh, you know, we shouldn't um, make any, any uh, uh, judgments on anyone's choices on uh, whether they deserve or want to come back or not. Uh, that's personal, uh, strictly a personal decision to be made. Um, as, uh, as Aaron already reported, uh, we've uh, reinstalled the new motor in uh, 1300. Um, and this will be our top priority to uh, get the, the car back in order or back running, uh, do the maintenance on uh, once we do start to uh, open up the, the uh, car barns. Um, but the good thing is, is that uh, except for the test runs that we need to do to give ourselves a little bit more confidence in the new motor, we'll just need to complete our normal preseason maintenance. Um, and that's the same with uh, with uh, car 322 also. Uh, we'll just need to do our preseason maintenance. Um, as Aaron reported about 1239, um, the uh, two motors are being uh, refurbished by LNS. Uh, we should expect them to be finished with uh, those motors in a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, new, new components are being fabricated by Rob Mangles and uh, also, we will be having some uh, uh, parts made by Truex Manufacturing. Um, so uh, that's, that's, uh, that's really the report as far as uh, CHSL. Uh, Chris, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, at, at ESL, um, again, uh, CAR 265 will be our, our top priority to get it back in operation uh, for the 2020 season. Uh, we, the, the way it looks right at the moment, uh, we need to uh, just do our normal preseason maintenance, uh, check the brake shoes, that do that type of thing, and make sure that it's ready. Uh, one correction to uh, Aaron's uh, or previous report, the controller that uh, was damaged actually happened on uh, car 78, not on Winona 10. Uh, and oh, that, thank you. Sorry about that. And uh, not a problem, Aaron. Uh, and but due to uh, great work by Howie Melko uh, that he did all at home, uh, he completely rebuilt that uh, controller. And as you saw in the picture, it looks uh, it, it's it's much better than than new. I can tell you that. Uh, we have actually put the controller back into the into the car. Uh, we're, the, the crew was working on uh, making all the hookups to, to that controller when uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic hit. And so uh, that's where, where we're at. Uh, certainly uh, we'll do any, uh, any, make any changes to the other controller uh, from what we've, uh, given what we've learned on the, uh, the AN controller, but, but uh, the crew has not had a chance to look at that other controller yet. Um, 
as, as Aaron said, Winona 10, uh, we're waiting for um, the new motor to be, uh, er, the motor to be rewound by AC Electric. Uh, the problem with that motor is that uh, it was built in about the 1890s and uh, the way that uh, the coil windings are, are made uh, without going into a lot of detail, um, it's, it's much different than, than is, is currently done. And so uh, they're having problems finding uh, uh, vendors that uh, can do that, that winding. Uh, given that, uh, I have approved them to, to have some samples made by uh, a coil winding house that was, was suggested to us. And uh, I haven't received any updates from AC Electric about how that's gone. So that's uh, where we're at with, with Monona 10's um, motor. Um, with Masabi 10, as Aaron said, uh, we're just going to continue to, to clean it out and uh, start to do some uh, refurbishment on it. But again, because of time uh, that we're, we have on the, in the barn this year, um, that may, may uh, we may have to put that off for a while. Uh, Fargo Moorhead 28 uh, is actually out in Watertown, Minnesota, in a in a fellow's barn. Um, uh, we moved it back in there uh, back in no in October of, of last year, and uh, it uh, it's in the back of his storage barn. Uh, this is a place that that normally stores boats for the winter and stuff. So uh, the the fellow that owns the place understands. Uh, that we're going to keep it there for a long time and uh, uh, there, we should have no problem with that at all. So that's about all I have. And if there's any questions, I can certainly try to answer them for you. Uh, Dick, uh, uh, what was the problem with the uh, A uh, controller in 78? And are there things that you learned from that failure that we should be looking for on the controllers on 1300 and 1239? Sure, good question, Russ. Uh, the, the biggest problem with that controller was that uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't bolted down real sturdily. And so uh, there was a lot of vibration that happened over time, and uh, what what that vibration did was to wear away the insulation on the wires, and there were some shorts that occurred. So that's especially in '78 what we're going to look at with the the other end controller. But uh, as relates to the other cars, uh, we, we need to make sure that those uh, controllers are are solid and they're in. Uh, you know, they're solidly mounted there so that, that uh, the normal vibration that happens because of, of the age of our streetcars and, and uh, just the way that they're designed and built and operate, um, that we don't have a lot of vibration that happens there. Or if we do, uh, we account for that in some way, shape, or form. Dick, there's um, a question from Dave French in the chat. Um, wondering if you could give us a brief recap of what the problem was with the 1300 motor, how it was fixed, and did that cost us additional money or was that covered? Um, yeah, I, I didn't see that. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, the the uh, problem with the 1300 motor was, was that uh, um, it it really, um, it just burned out. We, we had, uh, there was uh, some, uh, there's some problems that occurred that we didn't anticipate with, with that motor. And, and uh, because of the age uh, of the motor, uh, there was nothing that, that uh, we could, and, um, Nothing that we could uh, attribute to either the work done by LNS or Rob Mangles that that would have contributed to the the loss of that motor and and uh, the problems that happened. It was just a, a, a something that happened as as part of normal operation. So we we were not able to recover any uh, um, 
any damages from either LNS or from Rob. By the way, I should add though that we did get uh, a special grant from the 20th Century Electric Railway Foundation uh, to help pay for the repair of that motor and of uh, a 78's motor. So, and we also got some very generous contributions from the membership to cover that. Uh, do we have other questions for Dick Zawacki? Okay, if not, uh, the last report will be from uh, Rod Eaton. Um, because we're uh, not running for now, it seemed like a good idea to do more online. So, Rod? Um, well, good, good morning, everyone. We've been on Facebook for several years, uh, but last summer we kind of upped our presence a little bit and started to post something every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, our team is uh, Karen Kurtzman, Chris Heck, Ryan Long, and me. And Facebook is a good uh, medium for us, a good platform, because it puts kind of equal weight on both copy and photographs. Um, Chris, can you go to the next slide, please? Facebook also hits our demographic better than most of the other social media. Um, just very quickly, you can see that in the 25 to 34 age category, and especially 35 plus, Facebook is by far the, the dominant uh, preferred platform for people to communicate. And that's what we're looking for because we're looking at uh, families and women with families, and Facebook does tend to skew just a little bit more toward women than men. Chris? During the week, uh, every day has kind of a different theme. I think it's like the old Mickey Mouse Club where every day has a different theme. Uh, on Mondays, we used to post a schedule every day. We've dropped that for now, of course. Uh, we feature news or events from both lines. Uh, on Friday, Brian posts a history, kind of looking back. And on Wednesday, we do a rotating series of features like Bill the Motor Man says. Uh, next slide, Chris. There's a lot of ways to evaluate how well you do on Facebook. They compile a lot of data. One metric is called likes. Likes are people who are fans and uh, are willing to put their name behind that. And here's just a quick comparison of how we stack up against a couple of other local organizations. Uh, you can see that with about 2.3 thousand uh, likes, we are behind the carousel at, uh, at the zoo, way behind MTM, but we're ahead of the Association of Museums. So we have a lot of room to grow in attracting more people who like and follow us. Chris? Um, looking quickly at uh, some of the things that we've posted in the last few days, Reach and engage are two other metrics that you look at closely. Reach is the same as it would be in any other advertising. Uh, you're looking at how many people are exposed to your post. Engage is a real important metric because it's the number of people who you know looked at you and they did something. They clicked on your post or they said they liked it or they loved it or they did something else that showed you that they were really there. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. Um, you can see that some of our posts do better than others. Here's a, one of our rotating Wednesdays where we look at some car cards. Uh, this reached about 630 people and engaged 90 of them. Chris? Here's one of Brian's Friday posts. Um, it had a reach of 750 people, but look at how high the engagement numbers are. This is typical of uh, the Friday posts. A lot of people react to that. There's a lot of uh, questioning or communication. Sometimes Brian says, guess where this picture came from? And people will uh, jump on and take a guess at that or uh, comment on the location and so on. Uh, next one, please, Chris. This is a story about Excelsior. And this reached over a thousand people with a pretty respectable engagement of 200. Next one, please. And you can see that the numbers go up sometimes. Uh, this was a post uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, that talked about Steve McCullough's effort to collect uh, N95 masks out of our two shops and donate them to the Minnesota Nurses Association. This had a really strong reach of over 2000 people and engaged 460 of them. Next slide, please, Chris. 
Uh, and this is our champion to date. This is a, from just about two weeks ago when we announced on Facebook that we had a new video on YouTube uh, that showed the Comer Harriet line in the 1950s. This reached over 6,000 people with 1,200 engagement. Um, one of the major reasons that reach tends to go up is that people share posts. And that happened here. This had 35 shares. That means that people who saw this on their Facebook feed shared it with people on their Facebook feed. So you get an exponential growth of how many people are exposed to the post. And that really bumps up the reach. Uh, last slide, please, Chris. So what could you do? Uh, two things. Uh, with, with the lines down, we don't have any events to talk about. We don't have anything going on at the two lines that we can talk about. So content is becoming a problem. Uh, we could use more stories, especially as people start to go back to work in the shops. But other things that are happening behind the scenes uh, would also be good content. Facebook right now is a way that we can reach out to people and engage them. And that's what we need to do, I think, in a time when we can't have people coming down and going for a ride. So that engagement is important and they like to see what's going on. Uh, one of our higher posts had a, a photo of some of the people at the Excelsior Car Barn working on props for their Halloween event. That did very, very well. People were excited to see that. A post about how we working on the controller had a lot of people share that post. So um, content is an important piece of this whole thing. If you don't belong to Facebook right now, why don't you? It's free. Uh, it's not something that's uh, just for kids. In fact, it's much more of an adult medium. And you can be a, a, a like or a follower of our page, Minnesota Streetcar Museum, or just enter MSM. And then by liking and sharing our posts, you help spread that message to a larger audience. So that's our Facebook posture. Uh, if anyone has a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Brad, a suggestion? Brad, a suggestion? Yes. Um, what about doing some posts on Facebook going back as how the trolley uh, handled the 1918 flu epidemic? What changes they made, how it affected right? Because that would be, I would think that would attract a lot of interest. Uh, that's a good oh, idea, Steve. I uh, actually, I, uh, I just researched that because Dave French had suggested I do a story on it. And uh, in fact, I've got something written up and um, I think we can kind of put that one out on all of our various media. Uh, Rod, I'll get you some. Thanks, Aaron. Rod, there's a text question uh, from Dave French basically asking how we can track conversion rates from Facebook activity to actual people showing up to ride. Um, tracking people from Facebook to riding, that would be a hard thing to correlate exactly. One of the, one of the things that we post, for instance, on uh, maybe once a month or so is uh, an item that we feature from our store. And we've done that to see if we can affect sales in any way. Uh, the results of that have been pretty disappointing. I think we've only got one or two verifiable times when we've advertised something on Facebook and then actually had something uh, sold as a result of that. Um, one thing I'm looking at though, Dave, if you're listening, is trying to have, uh, these were ideas that we had before we realized that we might not be operating too much this year, but doing things that would involve contests or uh, prizes that might drive people from Facebook to one of the two lines to ride. Uh, we last year we promoted our events heavily, especially into the fall and, and as we went into winter. And uh, based on some of the feedback we got from Facebook, we know that that helped a little bit because people would say that they did that, they wrote on this, they saw Santa, and so on. But I, it would be difficult to find an exact correlation, just as it's difficult to find an exact correlation between any kind of advertising and direct results. Yeah, I can say, Rod, uh, anecdotally to that question, um, that honestly, I try to ask people pretty consistently how they found us, especially if they are clearly first timers, I don't recognize them, or younger type people who, you know, maybe they're not from the neighborhood or something. And pretty consistently last year, people had heard about us or some of our specific events on Facebook, and they wouldn't have heard about us otherwise. So I think that's 
an increasing thing. Even more people in 2019 than in my first year in 2018 seemed to have heard about us in some way, shape or form from Facebook, especially because some people just scroll through the Facebook events because you can explore and they say, oh yeah, I just found you. We're scrolling through things to do. And so I think that's why, like you mentioned, you know, putting out our actual events that we create, um, uh, like the little thing on our Facebook page and people can respond to it and say they're interested. I think that proved helpful just based on my anecdotal evidence. Like you said, you can't prove things easily, but anecdotally um, people were seeming to hear about us a little bit, especially on the younger side or certain young families. Thanks, Gordy. I, I have one follow on to that too. Um, so there, there was a shift last year that I volunteered on with Gordy and Rod actually, and it was one of the owl car shifts. And I think all of us made it a point that evening to ask people how they found out about the event. And without exaggeration, 100% of the people who showed up had heard of the event, either because Gordy had shared it on Facebook or because the Facebook page, Old Minneapolis, which has something like 95 or 100,000 likes to it, uh, had shared the information on it. And so that, that I think, emphasizes the necessity for us to try to grow our reach on Facebook as much as possible, because the more people re we reach, the more we get to show up, because we know that, as Rod said, only a, a small percentage of those who actually see this stuff act on it. And by the way, I should insert, one of the things I've been following since uh, Rod's campaign uh, to upgrade our content started was the number of people who are following us. And the answer is it's up 50% since last year. Uh, let's see, anything else for Rod? Okay, we've got one more piece of business to do for the membership meeting, which is uh, the election of directors. Uh, and then we will go into uh, the vintage video. So uh, the very first thing is we need uh, a, a motion to uh, approve by acclamation uh, Karen Kurtzman and Chris Heck as directors. And what just happened here, Rod? Uh, Chris? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Dick Zawacki. Um, I hereby move that Chris Heck and Karen Kurtzman are elected to fill the director positions on MSM's governing board, uh, board of directors for a term of three years, which will expire in March of 2023. Is there a second? This is Floyd, I will second. Okay, very good. Um, once again, uh, uh, Chris, I guess you need to take off the mute so we can have a voice vote. And all those in favor, oh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Opposed. Aye. 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 Uh, thank you, Karen aye. and Chris. You're you're. All right. Um, um, yes. Go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, everyone's muted, and you'll have to unmute, but you did. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm going to adjourn the membership meeting. And Okay, folks, uh, you, just, you just watched a streetcar cross the Bryant Avenue Bridge, and now we're riding the Bryant Avenue line. We're going to cross Minnehaha Creek on the gauntlet track. That's the two tracks that overlap but don't actually uh, come together in a switch. This was one of the few places that that existed. Now we're crossing the bridge over Minnehaha Creek. By the way, you'll see lots of cool 1950s cars as you watch this stuff. We're going north to south, by the way. How do they come together without a switch? Uh, well, it's not a switch. It was just a way to uh, squeeze two tracks together without the mechanism of a switch. Okay, now you'll see little breaks between them. This is Washington Avenue going by the federal building at 3rd Avenue South in downtown. Now we're going out the Minnehaha line and we're on 27th Avenue at 27th Street where we're stopped for, this is a, a, an MRA a Minnesota Rail Fans Association fan trip. And this is that same location uh, at 27th, little railroad action there, and you'll see a streetcar. Hey, Aaron, the, yeah. the video is jerky. Is, is that the way it's supposed to be? Chris, uh, it's looking I, good to me. 
it, it, it's just a, it's a result of trying to share it uh, online. Unfortunately, there, there really isn't any way to, to make it look better outside of just eventually uploading this um, with Aaron's narration to YouTube so people can watch it on their own. Okay, that's Minnehaha Avenue. I'm sorry, it's, a, it's also Minnehaha Avenue. We're headed out to Minnehaha Falls in Fort Snelling here. We're on, we're on the streetcar on Minnehaha Avenue. Is it getting any better, Jim? No, it's, I don't know about anybody else, but to me, it's just like little vignettes that happen every second or half second. Okay, yes. Okay. So anyway, we're turning into Minnehaha Park. This is into the stub of the old original line that used to go to Fort Snelling, but was shortened to Minnehaha Park. And here they come down, you can see the Milwaukee Road Minnehaha Depot on the left. They're on private right away. These are some of the last of the old original center posts, center poles for overhead wire. Now we're on the Fort Snelling uh, private right of way. And we're about to go and cross over the Milwaukee Road spur that uh, ran, they had a spur into the upper fort. This is crossing over the spur. Uh, this is another view in that same general area of Fort Snelling. This is kind of that Camp Coldwater area on the north side of it. Now here you see it actually crossing over the Milwaukee Road Spur. And we're headed into Fort Snelling. Now this is a fan trip on the Broadway line featuring the last of the lightweights, number four, which was the backup car for the Fort Snelling shuttle. And this is on Golden Valley Road at Upton Avenue. You, know, you tend to get a lot of fan trip footage. And here he is going around the Y. Uh, this is crossing the Broadway Bridge, and in the distance is the Grain Belt Brewery. And now, of course, the Broadway Bridge didn't dump into Broadway. It, it turned to the left and dumped into 13th Avenue Northeast. Now we're in the middle of the Grain Belt uh, complex, crossing the industrial spur that went down to Graco. And now we're uh, at Northside Station, running through the yard trackage. Of course, this is one of the four cars that was built for Stillwater Local Service in 1925. And then when that was eliminated in 1932, these cars were kind of spread around the system. Okay, now uh, we have a car turning off of Central onto Hennepin. And uh, if, if it looks a little out of focus, some of this old uh, eight millimeter stuff is. It's just not the highest quality. Okay, now this is at Broadway and Monroe, where the Broadway line and the um, Monroe line shared trackage on Broadway going by Logan Park. One of these cars there, that's the Monroe car followed by the Broadway car. Now we're on Washington Street Northeast up around 15th or so. Oh, here we are, another one coming around the corner at Broadway and Monroe. And now they had uh, a temporary track closure right here. They're working on the grade crossing with the Northern Pacific uh, Mulberry line. And so they put in one of these portable switches so the cars could run wrong track.
Oh, uh, this is Central Avenue up around Lowry. Aaron, if you move your cursor, that box might disappear, maybe. Oh. Uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, thank you. OK. Not well, sure. Least, OK. Uh, this is once again up on the Washington Northeast and uh, that same location at 18th Avenue. Now, this is Central Avenue, uh, almost up to Columbia Heights. You're about 35th Avenue north along Columbia Park. And now that's up at 37th and Central at the boundary of Columbia Heights. You know, we've tried to improve the color on these things, um, but can't do much about the focus. That's the same location along uh, Columbia Park. Yeah. All right, now we're downtown at First and Hennepin. That's a Columbia Heights car. There's the main post office right there. And he's turning onto First Street from Hennepin. Okay, that car is turning from First onto Hennepin. That's the Berman Buckskin building. He's going to come down to Marquette and turn right. So that would be a, Nic a Second Street Northeast Nicollet car. I love the two tone automobiles. Okay, this is an MRA fan trip turning around at Marquette and 2nd Street. Car 1269 was one of the inner campus gate cars and it was a favorite for fan trips. There's the main post office, same car. Oh, that's a bad, <laughs> that's on Marquette at the uh, 5th Street. And that jiggle was on the original film. I think it's a bad copy. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, well, Grant and Nicollet. And at, uh, at Grant Street, all the Nicollet cars went over to Marquette. Now, I think this is out of order. That's another Columbia Heights. All right, now we're on a Nicollet car about to cross Minnehaha Creek. I think this is fan trip footage. <clears throat> We're not going to use all of this footage, but it's uh, we had gotten as far as putting it in, in at least a pretty much geographic order. OK, now this is down at the 62nd and Nicollet Loop, the end of the line. There's the fan trip going around the loop. 62nd, of course, was the city limits of Richfield. Now we're running up Nicollet Avenue. This is on, on the, uh, there's a, one of the frost shield is up there on the window. That's, <laughs> that's Ed Nelson there running it. Ed, of course, was our longtime member and Russ Olson's collaborator on a lot of the Twin Cities early history stuff. And uh, Ed left town after the streetcars quit and ran trolleys in Toronto until he retired. There you see the big door handle for the gate car door. Looking out the rear gates. Okay, this next segment, we're still on the fan trip. We're going out Glenwood Avenue. You can see downtown in the distance. We're up, I don't know, about Gerard or Humboldt.
Uh, pulling into the end of the line at Glenwood Park, now Theodore Worth Park. They went on private right away for the last block and then backed into the Y. Now here he's backing into the Y. Of course, 1269 is a sister to 1267 that's out at Seashore in Maine. And I think we're going to go out the 4th Avenue line now. Yeah, this is on the edge of downtown. This is at 11th of 4th Avenue South and 11th Street. You can see City Hall in the distance. And we're headed out 4th Avenue. Uh, this is right next to the old Central High School at 35th Street. There you see Central High School. and the Hosmer Library at 36th Street that's still there. Now, I think the line was already out of service. That's why the bus is there. They, they ran a number of these fan trips on the day after, uh, after the line was abandoned. They hadn't shut off the power yet, but the buses are still there. Okay, this is the end of the line at 48th Street, backing into the Y. And pulling out of the Y to reverse direction. This is uh, Plymouth Avenue, uh, just west of Penn Avenue. I wondered for a long time where this shot was. And in the next shot, uh, let's wait for it. So that would be Plymouth and Russell right there. And this is how I learned where it was. That's Plippin's Delicatessen sign on the right. My dad used to take me there. So now they're at the corner of Plymouth and Penn. So unlike the Como Harriet line video, we have only fragmentary stuff from the other lines. There's a Kaiser for any of you auto fans. Uh, this is car 1268. And car 1268 was purchased. Uh, the priest at the Catholic Church in Robbinsdale was a trolley fan. And he purchased this car. And the body without the trucks was placed in the, in the uh, playground of the Catholic Church's school and was there for many years for the kids to play on. I don't know where the location is, but uh, that priest shot this footage. We got about four minutes or so to go here, and then I'll then I'll stop it uh, because this whole thing runs about forty minutes. That's longer than I think we can save some of this for the future. Uh, let's see, this is Lincoln Nicollet on the Selby Lake line. 
See Zip Slickers there. And this last series are the Selby Tunnel in downtown St. Paul. Here we are up on the top of the tunnel. And they didn't run real fast up and down this hill. 7% grade. They were supposed to tell you they had a certain elapsed amount of time. I forget how many minutes or seconds that they were supposed to take to get down this hill. As you see, he's not moving very fast. There was a terrible accident. We have a, a photo of it where a car coming in the other direction dropped off the middle there onto the top of the tracks and people were killed. One more view going down. That's that's another fan trip photo, I think. Yeah, yeah, there's the trolley fans. Coming out the bottom. This is the area where it's still intact, although it's deteriorated. And down 4th Street, where the Green Line operates today. And uh, we're about to go in front of St. Paul Union Depot, where the easternmost uh, station for the Green Line is. And I think I'm going to stop it right there, lying out. And let's just say that that's it. Um, what we'll do now is uh, we're going to uh, have a very brief board meeting to elect officers and appoint the class two directors. Uh, so anybody who wants to watch that, you're welcome. Um, the board members stick around here for about two, three minutes. And uh, Chris, can you put us, uh, can you put us on uh, screen there? I guess I get rid of this thing, don't I? I let's see. I there we go. I, okay, I, I closed that out. Okay, there. I All stopped right. your screen sharing for you. Okay. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. Um, all right. I see most of the people have signed off. So I will now call the uh, board meeting to order. Um, and uh, have we unmuted all the uh, board members? Please unmute yourself. Um, You've all received the agenda. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Chris Hello. Heck. Ah, Merle McKenzie is here. Excellent. Hi, Merle. All uh, right. Hi. OK. Uh, well, yeah, I, I was just going to say, before we get uh, yeah, the agenda. Yeah. OK. OK. OK so by me. <laughs> All right. I, I didn't hear a motion to approve the agenda. I, I, I was in the, the process of doing it, so you can put me down, Jim. Okay. And a second, please. <clears throat> Aaron Kurtzman seconds. Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, aye. next item. Uh, Jim sent out the board meeting minutes for the uh, last meeting on March 28th. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So move. That was Daryl uh, moving. Do we have a second? 
Dave French seconds. Dave French seconds. Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Before we go any further, if you yeah. if you don't mind, I'm just trying to to figure out who's here. Oh um, yeah. Thank is, you. I've got Aaron, Dave, Ben, and Daryl, myself, Karen, and Chris. Now Merle is here. Is John Dillery here? He is. John. Yes, John yeah, he, I see him there. Yeah, okay. So two, Thank four, you. I forgot about that. Six, seven, eight. That's it. We have all nine um, board members. Excellent. Okay. So our only two items of business are election of officers and appointment of the class two directors. So um, I am proposing that the slate of officers stay the same. I would remain the chair. Dave French would remain the vice chair. Jim Vicunas would remain the secretary and Chris Heck would remain the treasurer. Uh, can I get a motion to that effect? Ben Fransky so moves. And a second, please. Second. Okay. Girl. Merle seconds it. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Very good. All right, and then on appointment of uh, class two directors, um, Merle McKenzie, Daryl Leipold, and John Dillery have all indicated a willingness to serve another one year term. Um, and so I'd like a motion uh, to approve their appointments. Karen Kurtzman, I move to approve their appointments. Okay, and do we have a second? I'll second it. Daryl, I don't think you can second this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, I can't. But Dave French so moves. Second. Dave French, so, very French so moves. Okay. Uh, and thank you for doing this for another year. We much appreciate it. Uh, all those in favor of these appointments say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is approved. With that, we'll adjourn the meeting. Hey, Ben, I, uh, since I've got you here, um, <laughs> and, um, you, you had seen I sent you a, a, a text or two. I did. I'm entering my busy season of grading from now until May 15th. Um, so That's maybe okay. I, and, and, otherwise, this, yes, the answer is yes, we can do it. Uh, it's a matter of time. I might be able to touch base with Chris because uh, all the stuff to do it is down there. So um, if someone else is willing to actually do the, the setup work, I could touch base with Chris. He might be a, a likely candidate for that. Otherwise, after we hit May 15th, I'll be able to. And I'm happy waiting till then. Just know what we're talking about is Rod Eaton would like to have additional material uh, for online. And uh, one of the things he's going to do is to promote on Facebook some of the uh, PowerPoints that I narrated uh, for new member meetings um, that are already on YouTube. But one of them, Streetcars 101, I want to redo. The other thing is I, I've got to I've got to narrate a bunch of additional PowerPoints. But I'm having trouble doing that on my home computer. Uh, my my uh, program has been crashing, and I haven't been able to transfer the narration to movie format. So uh, I think that's best I can do that in the car barn. The other thing I'm hoping is that we can um, uh, we we can maybe arrange some uh, um, some book scanning sessions in the car barn with with one person at a time. Um, Yes, and I have the stuff now to complete that too. It's sitting in my entryway, so. Okay. Uh, anyway, those were just items since I got you together. Is there anything else that since we're all, all, all together here that people need to discuss? The meeting's formally adjourned. I, I can help well, you with the, the PowerPoint stuff, Aaron. Okay. Who, who else did I hear from there? Uh, I was just gonna say, we're hoping to be able to start the flea market on Saturdays in July, in Excelsior, mm -hmm. just so you guys know, that's our plan. Okay. By the way, I love the fact that you're standing in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, Chris, yeah, at some point, I'd like, to I'd like to learn how to do these backdrops, so something sure. better in my basement shows up. Sure. Uh, Does anybody question. else have anything informal or that we needed to discuss? Yeah, I had uh, uh, the thought crossed my mind 
when I got that uh, and forwarded it to you guys, that uh, 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 email blast from MTM about their procedures for opening up the shops, uh, their shop. And of course, they specifically said, you know, Osceola is closed, Jackson Street is closed to the public, but the shops are opening. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, I guess Dick would be the one to work on uh, uh, coming up with those procedures that MTM has so we can maybe get back to a little bit of that. But when will the board meet to talk about June in terms um, of ops or July maybe? That's a good question. I hadn't set a date, but it seems to me that maybe a week or two into May or something, we should have another session to decide what we want to do uh, with ops. Yeah, I was talking with Tim Fleming the other night, who, by the way, uh, used a part of his uh, largesse from the the IRS and uh, the federal government to join, uh, renew as a lifetime member, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, we were talking about it. And he, of course, he asked the question, when will we start operating? And I thought about it for brief, for just a second and realized, you know, when the restaurants are allowed to open up is when that's when we probably need to seriously discuss us, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, one of the things, uh, and I wish Rod Eaton was still on here, but uh, one of the things that, uh, with, for the Heritage Rail Alliance, which we are the members of, that is the uh, trade organization, it, they're putting together a, um, a little committee, uh, which I'm a member of, which I'm a member of to talk about, uh, boy, I'm getting feedback here, uh, to talk about the measures that are necessary for places to reopen and to achieve social distancing. So I'll be get, at least getting the latest on where the thinking is, and I'll be passing that along to you. So, anybody got anything else? Aaron, not, Stanley I, Castle is here. Hi, Stanley. I have some uh, unruly facial hair I'd love to give to you if you need any more. I'm growing my own, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on the uh, welding project that I suggested for the shop, I got control of that already. So thank you for talking to me the other week about it. All right. Peace well, and happiness. Very good. Okay. This is Karen Kurtzman. So are we saying that we're getting together again in the middle of May to discuss moving forward? Yeah, we'll get together a week or two into May. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll send something out. Okay, in the meantime, everybody stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aaron. Good night.